okay it's kind of acting up here on me I can't get some of the all the comments but if I go out a little bit like that I can then um, next we have Justice Bernal I'm a saved born again KJV Bible believing Christian who was kicked out of a KJV Baptist church building and told not to come back for witnessing to a couple of guests after service outside the building I was told I don't have because I wasn't given proper authority to teach preach baptize etc anything pertaining to and or about the Bible is this biblical um, Obviously, I know your stance on Babel buildings, and I am currently not a member of such, including the aforementioned. Good for you. How does one get authorized to perform any of the ordinances in the New Testament if such ordinances are biblical? I have no desire to baptize anyone. However, I'm not going to stop sharing the gospel. Um, okay, well, I can't. Let me just look up a verse here. I'm trying to think of where it is. I spelled it wrong. Okay, well, uh, you know, I don't know you personally, um, so I'm assuming that you were sharing the correct gospel, and, and you know, I don't know, I mean, and, and don't, please don't take this the wrong way, I, I'm not meaning to offend you, but, you know, for all I know, you could be preaching a false gospel, and that's why you were rebuked. But if you're preaching the true gospel, uh, yeah, I've seen that thing at Baptist churches. They'll do this thing of you're not in ministry, you shouldn't be witnessing. You're too, you haven't been saved long enough and stuff. They'll pull rank on you. Uh, the Baptists are some of the most prideful people out there. It's it's really quite disgusting. Um, but as far as you witnessing to people, Second um, Corinthians five verse eighteen says, "In all things are of God, who hath reconciled to us." To himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation after you were ordained. Now, actually, no, it doesn't say that. It says, given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So, the Lord has given you a ministry to reconcile men to him. Let's continue reading. Verse 19 To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Some Baptist, Papist, uh, power-mad, egotistical jerk coming along and telling you that you're not to witness to people, uh, they're standing in Satan's position at that point. Okay, they have nobody has any right at all to tell you that you should not witness. All right, that is absurd. Okay, you are ready to witness to anybody as soon as you get saved. All right, uh, there are things that you're going to have to go through the process of sanctification. I'll grant you that. You're going to have to learn the Bible and things like that. But uh, witnessing to people, I mean, if you just got saved and you understand how God saved you, can't you tell somebody else about it? You have to have somebody's permission to do that. See, that's why I'm, I'm rough on the Baptists a lot of times because they get very, very papal. You know, they, uh, how dare you speak against the man of God? You don't have proper, author proper authority and all this other stuff. I've been through that stuff. So, uh, you know, keep witnessing. Keep preaching the gospel to people and don't let anybody tell you not to do it. Okay? And stay away from the Babel buildings. Ben Heflin. Hey, brother, are you against Baptists in general or just their buildings. Well, I'm for Christians. Saved, born again, Bible-believing Christians. Uh, Baptists have a lot of pride issues. Um, if you take a Baptist per se and say, uh, Baptist, what do Baptists believe or whatever else? Um, you know, baptizing adults and, and supposed stands that Baptists take. Uh, no, I'm not against Baptists. But the problem is Baptists have a very funny way of professing one thing and practicing something entirely different and pretending that they are in line with Scripture when they're not. That's why I have a big problem with the whole Baptist system. Um, there's huge amounts of pride. Uh, there's just there's a lot of problems with the Baptists, a whole lot of problems. Uh, I've seen some that are very militantly just will lie about the Bible and... That's a problem. So that's how I would answer that question. 
Okay, next we have Dejo Soul. How to deal with guilt of past sins. Saved, but sometimes I feel really distraught at the ways I've let God down in my past life and, now I, and how I will in the future. Any scripture apart from 2 Corinthians 5.17 that can help, please. Um, give me a minute. I'm going to think of where this one's at. Uh, I understand. I understand what it's like to have things that you did in your past that were disgusting and dirty and terrible and you just, it grieves you and you think, you know, it's bad. Uh, Philippians chapter 3. Here's what uh, the Apostle Paul says about his past, his great education and all of his uh, big high degrees and whatever else. He says, uh, Philippians 3 verse 7, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the ex excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. So he was talking about the good things in his past, his religious uh, um, education and things like that. You read about that up in the couple verses above, you know, verses 4 through 6. You read about all the great things that Paul was, and he says, those things that most people would say I was a good person for, I count those things but dung. But now what about the problems of his past? What about the things that he did that he's ashamed of? All right, look at uh, verse um, 13 of the same chapter, Philippians 3, 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Did he struggle with things? Oh, sure. Paul had, you know, he, he had Christians killed. You know, he went into people's houses and he committed them to prison and things. I'm sure he could hear the screams of children in the back of his mind of when he was busting up their families and taking the fathers out to be executed. And what did he do? Well, forgetting those things which are behind you got to put that stuff behind you sometimes. When you start to think about the disgusting things or bad, wicked stuff you did before your salvation, you just got to put that stuff back and say, you know what, I'm here for a purpose. God didn't kill me right after he saved me, so that means he has a purpose for me being here. And I'm going to press forward toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He's given you a ministry of reconciliation. So the best thing that you can do is to forget about your past. If you've come to the Lord and you've, and He saved you, you've come and you've said, okay, Lord, I'm sorry about these sins I've done and I, won't, I need to put my faith in you because there's no way I can be good enough to get to heaven. I mean, I understand that. <laughs> and He saves you and now you're fighting for the Lord and you're serving the Lord and, and you're saying, okay, Lord, help me with these sins. Help me to stop doing that stuff. And you're, you're working towards that and things, or you've gotten victory over certain sins of your past, forget them. Forget them. They're under the blood. Uh, 1 John chapter 1 talks about the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin, past, present, and future. That doesn't give you license to sin. It just says, okay, your sins are paid for. So why worry about it? Why think about it? You know, do what you can. I mean, if, if, you're living in sin, then you're going to be punished, you're going to be chastened, chastened of the Lord, but you're not going to be condemned with the world. So, and that's how I would answer that. Um, Jennifer Bilbray. Could you please explain the outer darkness, or if you can give a quick reference on where I would find out about this topic in your video library, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Um, See if I can find the thing here. Okay, uh, the the one here, the terrifying reality of hell. Okay, this is the one that I talk about the thing of outer darkness. I actually uh, made that picture there. It's a normal photo of people in hell, and they got you know the, it's the orange and red flames and everything else. 
but I wanted to depict what outer darkness is. And I talk about it in depth in that study. Uh, the Bible says that hell is fire and brimstone. Brimstone is the Bible word for sulfur. Well, if you burn sulfur, it produces a almost invisible flame. Now, I, I have it depicted there as purple, you know, kind of a dark purple flame. But uh, the fact is that burning sulfur produces no real light of any kind. Um, in fact, I've heard that, you know, if you're burning sulfur, you have to put a little sign there that says, warning, you know, it's, there's a fire here. Um, pure sulfur does not give off light. So if hell, if the flames down there are generated by pure sulfur, like the Bible says, fire and brimstone, um, then it's going to be outer darkness, which is really a lot more horrifying when you think about it than the normal depictions of hell of red and yellow and orange flames. Uh, the real reality of it is it's going to be pitch black darkness. And I get into a lot of detail on that in that study. So I would recommend that one. The terrifying reality of hell. Okay. Uh, the book and a fiddle says, What about the doctrine of impeccability? Meaning Jesus didn't sin, but could, have, could he have? I know many go to Hebrews 4.15, but I don't think it was even possible for Jesus to sin at all. Verses why below. Of course, he was tempted, as the verse says, but the devil could tempt me, but that doesn't mean I find it tempting, you know. So in Luke 4, I don't actually see Jesus finding the temptations of Satan desirable. Plus, Joseph was not the father of Jesus, so he was born with no sin nature, right? Yeah, I would say that. Um... You know, 1 John 1, 5, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. John 5, 19, And answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son, of, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, there these also doeth the Son likewise. James 1, 13 through 14, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempteth he any man, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. It's a good question. Um, you know, uh, turn to Hebrews 4.15. I know the verse you're talking about, but I just want to read it for people. Uh, Hebrews 4.15 says, um, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And you're right. It says he was tempted, but he didn't sin. So um, God cannot sin. Um, so, you know, again, you're getting into the thing of the Godhead there, and you kind of go, well, how can, you know, how does this stuff work out? Well, you know, God came to this earth, and he is not capable of sinning. And because uh, if he was, he wouldn't be God. So, you know, yeah, I mean, uh, the doctrine of impeccability, you know, some of these uh, things people come up with, um, you know, Jesus did not sin. You know, it, and I say that some of the stuff people come up with because, you know, I read through my Bible, I don't see the doctrine of impeccability. And I understand that people are trying to define different terms, but you start getting into this theological, you know, books written on theology and stuff like this, well, the doctrine of impeccability, three chapters on it or something like this. Um, you just simply read the Bible and believe the Bible. And uh, Jesus obviously did not sin when he was here on the earth. He could not have sinned because he was God. Simple. Chief Jobu. I know I asked one other question. Two questions again, people. But can you explain what the cloven tongues of fire means in Acts chapter Acts chapter 2, verse 3 means? I know it's about languages, but how? Um, don't really understand the question there. Uh, Acts chapter 2. I'll kind of give you another little angle to this thing here. Uh, Acts chapter 2. I will start at verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And they appeared, there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, 
and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And then it goes down through, and you see um, verse 6, uh, it says here, But now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Then it goes on to list the languages. Okay, the next couple of verses there, verses uh, 8 down through 11, the languages are listed. So the charismaniacs try to make it into this liberty blobberty tongue thing, and that's not it. Tongues is the Bible word for languages. Those two words are used interchangeably. So... Um, what was the thing of the cloven tongues uh, like as a fire? Well, it, that was the appearance of it. Cloven tongues like as a fire. Uh, what's the significance of why the Lord had it appear that way or whatever? I have no idea. Again, that's something that the Bible doesn't really say one way or the other. Why was it cloven tongues like as a fire? They weren't tongues of fire. They were like as a fire, too. That's important as well, because that's another thing they say, you know, you're good, filled with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And you look at the passage, it's talking about two different baptisms. One with the Holy Ghost, the other one the people are in hell, in fire. Um, so it's important to keep that distinction that it's cloven tongues like as of fire. But, uh, you know, I know it's about languages, but how? Well, I don't really understand what you're trying to say with that. Um, you know, God just chose something cloven tongues like as a fire to come upon the early Christians there, and they were able to speak with other languages. Uh, again, signs and wonders were there uh, to to confirm the word of the Jewish people. That's what it was about. So, uh, Tom Dunn, do you believe that Cyprian's quote of First John five seven made between 215 to 280 AD is a good way to defend it being in the Bible. Thank you very much for your response. Uh, yeah, I do. Um, simply because the liars will say that there are no, uh, there's no support, you know, it was just found in late manuscripts, you know, and Erasmus didn't even have it and whatever, the Johannine comma, they call it, 1 John 5, 7, and they'll make all these wild claims and everything. But church fathers are quoting 1 John 5, 7 in some of their writings. So if it's not around until much later with a late manuscript that Erasmus got a hold of later on in some of his editions, why are church fathers quoting it way back in the third century? Kind of weird. But, you know, I would say that, but then I would say, but I'd be careful about quoting church fathers. Okay? Church fathers were very heretical. The church fathers, you know, they're extremely heretical in a lot of their beliefs. Um, I'm not going to go into a whole big thing on them, big rant on that, but uh, they're very heretical. Uh, but the fact that they were quoting 1 John 5, 7 proves that it wasn't just made up later after some late manuscript, you know, put it in or something to the text. That's not true. Um, early church father citations are a way that you can prove uh, certain texts of the Bible, the antiquity of certain texts that they were around, you know, very early on. So I would say yes, you know, but I would say, you know, Cyprian and some of these other guys that did quote 1 John 5, 7, I would use those arguments to defend 1 John 5, 7 being in the Bible, but I would make sure to tell people, but I'm not recommending Cyprian. I'm not recommending, you know, some of these other early church fathers, Justin Martyr and some of these other guys. I'm not recommending them. And I uh, can't think of some of the other guys right now. Polycarp was another one. I don't recommend them, but the fact that they're quoting this verse proves the antiquity of it. That's what I would say. Robert Crow the Fourth, Matthew twenty-seven fifty-two through fifty-three speaks of the dead arising, then went into the holy city and appeared to many at the rapture. Could the dead in Christ, who rise first, possibly appear to many throughout the world before the rest of us are called up to meet Jesus? Man, can you imagine that? If that wouldn't get folks' attention, nothing will. <laughs> Thanks for y'all's tireless work and love for Jesus. Well, thank you for a good question. Um, if you don't know the passage, you can go there and read it yourself. We're not going to go there uh, that this brother here is referring to. The dead saints of the Old Testament did come up with Jesus, and they're walk, you know, walking around the holy city and things after the resurrection there. Um, but here's what my take on that whole thing is. 
Okay. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Uh, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. So you have, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the dead come up. But is, is there a time interval between them and living saints going up? Well, the other big one, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Uh, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. So, I don't see anything where they're, the dead in Christ rise first and are on the earth, and then we both go up to the clouds. Um, I don't really see that there. I think it's they get caught up into the clouds, and as they're going up, we which are alive and remain also go up. It's in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Um, it's an imminent boom. It happens. It's done. You know, um, you know, I think part of the thing of God sending them strong delusion, like it says in Second Thessalonians chapter two, uh, it's because they received not the love of the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So God's not going to give people a chance when all of a sudden they see D. L. Moody walking by, going, "How you doing? You better get saved." You know, Rapture is going to be here in about five minutes. You know, and, and all of a sudden they look over here, and here comes Apostle Paul walking by, and there's Mary. You know, the real Mary, not the Catholic Mary, and she's walking by. You know, and stuff, and out there, you know, holding up a little sign saying "repent." You know, <laughs> no, I don't. I don't think so. It'd be interesting. It would be interesting, but I just don't see any scripture for that. I think it's going to be a very quick, boom, dead go up, living go up, and God sends strong delusion. Not, uh, you know, the saints are walking around on the earth for a while, and then we all go up. I don't. I don't think so. Uh, Cindy Long says. Genesis 1, 3 through 5, account of light, darkness, day and night, and the fourth day, creation of lights in the firmament, Genesis 1, 14 through 18. What is the light created on the first day of creation? Thanks. I feel guilty asking, seeing all these other questions. Well, it's all right. You know, that's what I do. I answer people's questions. I try my best. Um, what is the light that was created in Genesis chapter 1 before the sun? Well, it's actually read these verses uh, Genesis 1 3 through 5 because again you know when people bring up things like this don't just go yeah that's interesting in order turn to the scriptures get into the habit of turning to the scriptures and actually read the scriptures and then wait on the Lord and say okay is the Lord going to give me the answer here or am I going to do some more study am I going to have to look into the word light what does the word light mean and where does it show up and where does this and where does that and whatever else um Genesis chapter 1, verse 3 through 5 says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and then darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Okay? Um, it's kind of interesting because if you go down to um, mm, verse 11, it says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit ye tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and, his tree, and, the, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And verse 14, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. Wait, I thought that there was light already. Hmm. So plants and everything survived without the sun and the moon. 
Yeah, because they're created there. Um, you know, the two great lights are created in verse 16. God set them in the first in the firmament in verse 17. Okay, so very interesting. There was light there that took care of the earth, the plants and the vegetation before the sun and the moon. Hmm. Now I'll show you what my theory is on that. It's a very good question. Turn back the whole way back to the back of the Bible, Revelation chapter. Uh, Revelation chapter 21, verse 23. It says here, And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. So the city there in eternity, the new Jerusalem, is actually lit by the light of Jesus Christ. Now, of course, Jesus Christ is eternal. It's not that God created him there, that God created the light or whatever else. But it could be that the Lord said, okay, at this point in time, we're going to, you know, give off this light and that's going to take care of the earth. And, you know, again, I don't know how all that stuff works out. See, this is the thing with, with you know, being a preacher and teacher to Bible-believing Christians. You people come up with some of the most interesting questions. <laughs> it's just like... Some of these questions, I'm just like going, man, you know, how in the world do you answer stuff like this? <laughs> you know, I try to be honest. I try to give you my best interpretations, but some of these questions are good stuff, man. I just like, so that would be what I would say. Very, very, very good question. Um, I would say that that light is a reference to Jesus Christ. And it's not that he was created. It's just that he said, okay, I'm going to give forth light now. Uh, he had the abilities within himself, and he says they're, you know, in Genesis 1, 3 through 5, he says, okay, I'm going to shine and, the, and my light is enough to make the plants and everything grow and, and take care of everything. And then later on, he says, okay, here's the sun and the moon. And we're actually going to go back to the way that was in eternity. That Jesus Christ is the light of New Jerusalem. And there's no need for the sun and the moon. Okay. Uh, Stanislav Tarov um, says here, right here, another question. Why do you call yourself Bible believer? All right. Good question. But again, I said one question. You have to start charging or something here for these different questions. I don't know. Joking, of course. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. I do have a study, what is a Bible believer? Um, go here to my channel. Again, just type in Bible believer. Okay, right there you go. What is a Bible believer? Okay, first one that comes up. But we'll, I'll answer your question from Scripture here. You can go to that study and it gives you all the Scriptures on it. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, the Bible, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually also which effectually worketh also in you that believe. I don't believe that this book was written by men. You say, what about the translators from 1604 to 1611, the 54 men and uh, Lancelot Andrews? And, uh, okay, yeah, I know about all that stuff. Um, I know a lot of the names of the translators. Um, you know, there were some very godly men and things involved, but God is the one that directs people. I've seen God take some of the most wicked, lost people out there and speak truth through their mouth. And it doesn't mean that they're saved or whatever. I've just seen God can use anybody, anything in His creation. He can use them at any time just by going and taking over them. You see, back in the Old Testament, uh, God calls Nebuchadnezzar, this very, very wicked king, He calls him my servant. Why? God controls everything. So... 
I look at the translation that happened back in, in with this King James Bible, and I say that was God that did that. God used those men for His purpose to give me this King James Bible. So I don't receive this book as, well, it's just a translation. I say, no, this is God's book. And I can preach that and teach that with authority. And I can say, this is God's Word. And when you believe that, then it will work. I mean, if you don't believe that this is God's book, then why are you calling it God's book? This is God's Word, but not really. It's God's Word, but it has translation mistakes in it. It's God's Word, but I can point out where it should have been written better. Well, think about what you're saying there. You're saying that you're smarter than God, if you really believe it's God's Word, or you're saying that you're lying. You're calling a book God's Word when you don't really believe it. So, being a Bible-believing Christian means that I accept that this book came from God, this King James Bible comes from God, and I will believe what it says, and I will base my, my system of beliefs off of this book. Not off of my feelings, not off of church councils or whatever else. I'll judge everything by the book. That's what being a Bible-believing Christian means. That's why I call myself a Bible-believing, a Bible-believer, excuse me. Okay, H. Gaming says... Brian, does living an obedient life constitute serving the Lord, or does serving the Lord require some actual ministry? Hope you understand what I mean. Thanks for your time. Romans chapter 12. I know exactly what you're talking about here, I think. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, that ye, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. All right. Um, did that say, for those of you who are in ministry, present your body as a living sacrifice to God? Uh, no. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That goes for everybody. Uh, I'm just going to answer this by telling you a little bit of a personal thing here, and that is about my son. I'm not going to train my son to be a preacher. I'm not going to train him to be in ministry. I'm going to teach him everything I know about how to work with you know, his hands, uh, cut trees down, work on ATVs, motorcycles, um, you know, hunt, fish build things out of wood, uh, use a wood lathe. I'm going to teach him every skill I can. And it's up to him, it's between him and God someday if he would become a preacher. I don't think we're going to be here that long, but you understand what I'm saying. When you get saved, your responsibility is to present your body a living sacrifice to God. God will show you if you're supposed to be in full-time ministry or if you're supposed to work at a construction business and just witness to people on the job site okay um, you're not somehow less if you work out there in the world than somebody who's in ministry all right uh, somebody who's in ministry there's a there's a special calling from the Lord the Lord says okay I'm going to prepare you for that um, but being in ministry is a very rough thing uh, it's it's to be quite honest it's very awful sometimes <laughs> I'm, I'm speaking bluntly here uh, there are times when I get really sick and tired of not getting good sleep and uh, spiritual attacks happening and physical problems and, and just being called every name under the sun and just and I think yeah it sure'd be easier just to have my secular job back again you know uh, there are times it gets very wearying you know the Lord himself you know got got very very tired of dealing with his own disciples and he'd say how, how long shall I be with you how long shall I suffer you uh, ministry is not something that every Christian full-time ministry, we're not all called into that. Um, you're going to be judged for your service to the Lord. Did you present your body as a living sacrifice to God? Um, and that can come in a lot of different ways. And so uh, to say living an obedient life, you know, you have to somehow serve the Lord all the time. Everybody has to be full-time ministry. Uh, the Bible doesn't teach that. Um, you know, you're to be found faithful. 
uh, that's, that's what you're supposed to do with your life. If God has given you a talent for something, some kind of a job or whatever out there in the secular world, and you can do that and give God the glory for it, and you're cleaning up your life and whatever else, well, you know, praise the Lord for that. You'll be judged for that. Um, but if God puts a special call upon your life for full-time ministry, um, then you'll be judged, you know, for that. And it's it's not some kind of a thing that I even, you know, you, you got to be real about it, is the whole thing. And it's it's rough sometimes. And, you know, I mean, the, the, the blessings and stuff that come are phenomenal and wonderful. You know, when you hear somebody get saved or you lead somebody to the Lord and things, uh, it, it's it's amazing. It's wonderful. Those are the good times, you know. But it's it's an emotional roller coaster ride, to be quite frank. Um, it's 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 not easy. And so to say that all Christians have to be doing that, or else they're no good, or something. No, we're not all called into that. Uh, you do what the Lord tells you to do. Um, that's what I would say to that. Um, Kenny W. says, what's the best way to read the KJV Bible from Genesis to Revelation? Uh, well, you can do that. You can start at the beginning, go the whole way through. Um, if you're new to the Bible, um, I would say John and Romans are two of the most important books. Uh, the Pauline Epistles, I, I read that. Um, you know, try to read that a lot. Um, there's a lot of different books and things you know, that I recommend, but there's really no set method. Uh, just you go through the Bible and, and um, just do what the Lord tells you to do. Uh, but yeah, Genesis to Revelation is fine. Definitely. Uh, the truth is out there says, In one of your videos, I think it was imminent martial law, you said that you believe that martial law could happen before the rapture. I'm just curious to see why you believe that. If martial law were to happen, then that would almost definitely mean a civil war here in America. And America has the most Christians in the world. If a war like that were to happen here, that would be one of the worst wars in recent history in terms of death rate many Christians would die, then who would be left for the rapture? Also, don't you think that many Christians would lose faith in the pre-tribulation rapture and start accepting the post-tribulation rapture? Thanks. Um, let me find the verse here. I'm thinking of one came to my mind. Um, Romans chapter 8, verse 35. It says here, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Um, there have been really bad things that have happened to Christians down through the centuries. And I dare say that many of them were stronger than Christians here in America. Um, just seeing military developments in the area is why we made the video. And that video was not a, hey, everybody get paranoid, hey, everybody get scared. That wasn't it. It was a call to action. Uh, when you see evil rising and you see God about ready to judge a nation, uh, we need Christians to get more serious in their walk with the Lord. That was the point of that video. I wasn't trying to tell people, you know, arm up, it's time to go to war, we're going to have a big civil war. And I know you're not saying that we, you're not advocating that, but I'm saying I'm calling Christians to, to you know, a desire for repentance. Um, saying, yeah, Lord, I shouldn't have those movies in my collection over there, and I shouldn't have that book, that's wicked, and I'm sorry, Lord, I shouldn't have watched that video last night on YouTube, and, and, uh, Lord, I'm sorry. I shouldn't, have, I shouldn't have laughed at that joke at work today. And I heard that person use your name in vain. I didn't say anything. And That's what I'm talking about. That's what my desire is. That's why we did that video. Yes, things are getting very, very bad. We're on the brink of World War III. How do we fight that? Well, by Christians getting down on their knees and repenting and saying, you know, God, if there's any wickedness in me, if there's anything I need to clean up, I want to present my body as a living sacrifice. See? I just said in the other comment there. That's what it's about. Um, could there be a major war? Who would be raptured if there was? Well, Christians have been slaughtered uh, for thousands of years. Christians, I shouldn't say thousands, but uh, 
since the beginning, Christians have been slaughtered. It could happen again. Um, I'm trying to, you know, advise Christians to stay right, stay holy, and, uh, you know, the Lord will protect us. But if Christians are starting to mess around and act like the lost world, uh, God's not going to protect this nation. And this nation is very, very wicked. And, you know, if Christians start to go, well, maybe it's okay that the sodomites agenda is, is okay and I don't, I don't really want to speak against it. if somebody wants that for their life that's okay and if Christians start doing that it, we're going to see God's wrath come down on this country God's not going to protect us okay and um, if that happened uh, that there was some kind of a martial law takeover and a big civil war race war whatever else uh, yeah a lot of Christians are going to lose faith faith in the pre-trib rapture excuse me rapture there's a lot that already have. There's a lot that already think that we're in the time of Jacob's trouble and whatever else. Um, that's just people, you know, quitting on the Lord. You know, it doesn't really prove one thing one way or another whether we're going to be here for that, for bad times or not. So, uh, Top Secret says, Is there a reading plan that makes the most sense and that also connects the dots from book to book? What do you think about the Book of Enoch? Is it valid? Okay, I've talked about this before. The Book of Enoch is not valid. It's a written by Gnostics, heretics, people that are not saved. Um, it's got all kinds of problems. I have an FAQ on that. You can look it up, showing some of the nutty nonsense in the thing. Um, but is there a reading plan that makes sense and that also connects the dots from book to book? Um, no. No, not that I know of. I mean, again, I'm, I'm skeptical of reading plans and study guides and all that stuff. They're written by man. Um, let the Holy Spirit lead you and teach you. Um, trying to think of a verse to use there. Um, boy, I'm trying to think. Sorry, my, I'm quoting so many scriptures right now. My brain is just... Probably should take a break here soon. Uh, okay. Should have known it was there. I was trying to think of where that was, but um, First Corinthians chapter two, verse twelve. Here's your reading plan. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, not from a study plan. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So your connecting of the dots is going to be done by the Holy Spirit. Again, the whole idea behind Bible-believing Christianity is to develop that personal relationship with you and the Lord. Not with you and your local church or you and your pastor or you and your wife or husband or whatever you are. You know, it's to develop that personal relationship between you and the Lord. There's one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. We're to have that personal relationship with the Lord. He will guide us into all truth. All right? Uh, that's what I would recommend there. Stay away from the book of Enoch. Just read the Bible. You can start Genesis, go to Revelation. You can read through the New Testament, uh, pick books and whatever else. It, it'll, the more you study it, the more it'll make sense. The more you'll see the tie-ins together. It's, it's really a, an amazing book. Um, N. Wilson says, "Where should believers look for a wife or a or husband if not at a church building?" Going to church is one of the best occasions to meet fellow single Christians. Uh, well, honestly, I've never seen that. Um, I've been there, college career, you know, group and stuff like this, and I've seen this thing of you get set up with people. Uh, they kind of like, you know, try to set up their young people together and things like this, and I oh, will get you a job, you know, and, you know, for the young women and stuff, and and we got a young man that you could meet, so we'll, we can have a new faithful tither and everything else, and stuff like this. Uh, I don't agree with that. Um, personally, uh, I met my wife actually through being in ministry. I tried. I mean, I, I tried. I tried single Christian dating websites online. 
That failed, thank the Lord. Uh, I remember this one, it was so funny. It was like uh, recommended by James Dobson or something like this. And it was like, uh, you know, was it Christian Mingle or something like this? And they had this thing, like you fill out this survey and then they find like the perfect match for you. You know, like your beliefs, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And they'll find a perfect match and it's got like 10,000 people, members of this thing. And I did this thing just, you know, I don't know if it's going to work or not. I was just like, Lord, I don't know. I'm just, I can't meet anybody to save my life, you know. So I filled this thing out and it came up with zero results. <laughs> Out of like thousands and thousands of women, you know, it came up with nobody that was like me. And so I was like, okay, that doesn't work too good. And then I was like, I went to different bath, like cult buildings, and it was like, oh, you know, so and so could date you and stuff like this. And it was like, yeah, I'm looking, going, uh, no, you know. And I actually had a, a woman contact me. She had two young daughters that were single, and she's like, you know, they're both around your age, and I'm going to talk to them and stuff like this, and I'll set it up and everything. And they both were like, he's too militant. You know, we don't want to marry that guy. So it didn't work. And uh, finally, I was just like, okay, you know, whatever. Uh, you know what, I'm just going to serve you, Lord. I'll just be an Apostle Paul kind of a guy. I'll be a single guy. I want to get married in the worst possible way, but I'm, not, I'm just not going to marry a woman that is going to wreck the ministry or get me out of the ministry. I'm going to wait. If I have to die a single man... I'm going to wait until the Lord brings me a wife that can stand with me in the ministry. And I was just like, you know, it's okay, you know, I'll just wait on you, Lord. And I just kind of forgot about it. I just kind of gave up looking. And I get this email from um, this young woman, and I find out that uh, through writing back and forth with her that she was single, and one thing led to another, and I have a wife who saved and who loves the Lord and is in the ministry with me. And I didn't find her at a Babel building. So uh, where should believers look for a wife or husband if not at a church building? Uh, well, if you get one from a church building, there's a good chance that she's going to be messed up doctrinally and uh, want to bring you into the church building because that's her social club. Um, I would say you're better off just uh, witnessing and... Um, Letting the Lord bring one into your life that you can lead to the Lord and then teach her the right way so she's not messed up with the new versions or anything else. Uh, that's what I recommend. Let the Lord be your matchmaker. Okay, Ocean View. Brian, what do you think about Gregory Miller? He seems very prideful on some of his videos. I know he stands for the local church. I don't see any videos of him preach, preaching against tithing. Just wanted your feedback. Um... Greg has some good stuff. Uh, definitely, I've learned some things from him. Um, uh, I do believe the Lord uses Greg. Uh, you know, I, I'm not going to say a whole lot. I don't want to rip on the guy and, and tear down another ministry because there's certainly very few that are standing anymore. And it just gets kind of wearying. Um, but Brother Greg and I def definitely disagree on some things. And um, we had a big blow up a long time ago on the gap theory issue and he was using some language that was not appropriate and uh, you know I'm, I'm certainly not a uh, um, effeminate little sissy that doesn't use some abrasive language once in a while I do I call people stupid and idiot and whatever else but I don't call people some you know kind of vile sexual type of, of names and stuff and Greg was using some language that I just it was upsetting and I just I had to shut down the comments I deleted his his comments and I blocked him from the channel for a while and we've kind of made peace since then um, but to me it's just like Greg's got his thing going and I got my thing going and it's not like you know we got to be the you know the special tag team that goes out after the enemies and stuff you know uh, you're going to see that thing in the Pauline epistles where Paul and Barnabas did some great work together, and then they had a contention among them that was so sharp they parted company. And Barnabas left the Lord and went back to the world, and he was hanging out at bars last time you heard it. No, 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 no. Barnabas did his thing. He had his own ministry, and he went out and he did his thing. Paul went out and did his thing. Paul joined up with Silas then, you know, and they were out doing missionary work and stuff like that. Uh, you're going to have that in ministry. You're going to have 
um, saved men that come together and they're working together and they're they're kind of friends and th things like that and then they'll have a contention sometimes why because the Lord wants them spread out uh, there was an old doctrine in, in the infantry back in World War one and uh, I guess they still teach it actually and that is that you're not to clump together if you're rushing the enemy don't all join together because the enemy can just lob a artillery right in on you and wipe out the whole company or whatever you know you don't want to do that spread out you know spread out I mean you can get a bullet hitting one soldier and going through him and hitting the guy behind him stay separate you know um, give you a scripture on that one uh, let's see I can get this one here quickly. Romans 15. Uh, I'll start at uh, Romans 15, verse 19. Through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. Okay. Um, Paul was saying, hey, you know, brother so-and-so is over here, and he's got that place over there taken care of. You know, brother Greg is down in Ohio. I'm here in Maine. I don't need to go down to Ohio and try to preach the gospel where Greg is at. All right, um, I don't need Greg coming up here and trying to preach the gospel here. You know, I look and I say, okay, he's got his thing going down there. He's, whatever issues he has, that's between him and God. Um, I'm up here preaching the gospel. Whatever issues I have, that's between me and the Lord. And so, you know, with Greg, I'm just like, I watch his stuff occasionally and things. He brings out some good stuff, and I respect him. And uh, I believe Greg is, is definitely 100% a saved man. Uh, what issues I have with him, you know, that's between him and the Lord. They'll, they'll sort that stuff out. But he's doing a work down there. I'm thankful that Greg has taken the stands against the easy believism stuff um, and many of the other things that he takes stands against. Uh, he's never once backed off on the King James Bible. I thank the Lord for him. So that's my stand on Greg Miller. Okay. Uh, Joseph, Genesis 50, 20 says, What do you do as a wife when a lost husband insists on fellowshipping with false Christian relatives? Uh, well, I'm trying to think of the verse. That's uh, in Ephesians, I think. Um, Ephesians 5 verse 11 Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness but rather reprove them for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light for whatsoever doth make manifest is light um, Wherefore he saith Awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead and Christ shall give thee light See then that ye walk circumspectly not as fools but as wise redeeming the time because the days are evil. Uh, when, a, when a husband is, is hanging out with lost Christian professing, you know, false Christian relatives, I understand that. And uh, what you do in that time, um, yes, you have to be submissive to your husband as a woman, that's true. Um, but you have a relationship to the Lord as well. And what you'll find is if you start to talk about the things of the Lord, those relatives aren't going to want to be around you. Okay, and it's going to go back onto your husband, and he's going to have a decision to make. Either go with God and go with what you've been saying, and if they get offended at you speaking to them about the Bible version issue or whatever else, if he turns on you and says, hey, don't say that stuff, you're offending my relatives, he's going to answer to God for that. Okay, and you say, am I wrong for telling them the truth? 
you know. And if he says, well, I, I don't know, or whatever. I mean, if he's really truly saved and and wants to serve the Lord, the Lord's going to reveal that stuff to him. He's going to feel vexed by, you know, that unfruitful works of darkness that his relatives are in, too. You know, and you just simply, you know, I, I've long held on to the belief that the best place for a Christian to be is on the front lines of the battle. That's the safest place to be as a Christian. And what I mean by that is be as fanatical as you possibly can. Uh, lukewarm Christians make God sick. And the best thing that you can do is not be purposefully offensive, not be a jerk about things, and just try to pick fights with people. I'm not saying that. Uh, we're not supposed to strive. We're to be gentle unto all men, have to teach patient and meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, Second Timothy chapter 2, towards the end of the chapter. Uh, that's there. But um, we should be not afraid to speak the truth. Uh, speaking in love, but when you get around these lost relatives, just start saying, you know, um, you know, the professing Christians and stuff say, hey, I got a question for you, isn't it? You know, or here's a good one. Uh, just say, you know what? It's interesting. I've been looking into this thing. I mean, show up with a, a Bible version issue book or something. Show up with a David Daniels book and just be like, hey, do you have an NIV? You got to see this. They take these verses out and stuff and, you, and start showing them verses that are taken out of the NIV and stuff and say, you know, it's amazing how these you know, modern churches are doing this wicked stuff and everything else. And you'll see them looking down at the ground and everything else. Now, if your husband's saved, he's going to see that and he's going to say, I have to make a decision one way or the other. Got to work that stuff out. So that, that would be my advice to you on that. Um, just stand for the truth. Be, be militant for God's truth. And the Lord will separate what's going on there. Uh, if your husband is not genuinely saved, if he's a kind of a rotten individual himself, well then the Lord's going to make things happen there to either get him saved or you know, get him out of your life. Be quite frank with you. If he is saved, then the Lord's going to convict him. Next we have Felipe Kennedy. I am your brother in Christ, and I would like to know if you think the Olympic Games that will be held in my country is cursed, as the wolf Paul Begley said, and he's making all sorts of demonic videos saying God told him so. Yeah, well, Paul Begley is a false prophet. He's definitely a liar. God tells him things, you know, God gave me a prophecy. It's a 50% chance of it coming true. He said in one of his videos, I, I have a bunch of videos on Paul Begley. Um, the guy's a nut. Uh, the Olympic Games is definitely an occult thing. Uh, I'll show you the philosophy behind it. Again, I'm trying to give scripture for each one of these answers I, I'm giving. Um, I'll show you why the Lord doesn't like things like the Olympic Games. Okay. Uh... Genesis chapter 11, verse 1 says, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them throughly. And they had brick for, for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach into, unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. Let me stop there for just a minute. It's interesting that a lot of these cities are actually building huge sports stadiums just for the Olympic Games. And the Olympic Games, you look at the opening ceremonies and stuff, it's paganism. Just ridiculous paganism. I saw a thing on the history of the Olympics the one time. And the, the founder of the Olympic Games actually had his heart cut out when he died and had it placed inside a little urn and put inside an obelisk, an Egyptian obelisk. Not very uh, good thing to do there. But look at verse 6, Genesis 11, verse 6. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be strain, restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. All right? Uh, God scattered them out. He said, get away from each other. I don't want you to be all one. And yet that's the whole 
thing of the Olympics. All the nations coming together to be one and play sports. And I saw an article recently where they were talking about the Olympic Games that are going on right now. You know, uh, you know, in your country there, in um, was it uh, Brazil? I think Rio de, de Janeiro. I think it's Brazil, isn't it? Yeah. And um, uh, they said about that. There's like they ordered like, and excuse me, I have to say this, but they ordered like 450 thousand something condoms or something like this because of all the fornication that goes on among the athletes. You know, and they ran out last time they had a Summer Olympics. Giving out free condoms to these athletes and stuff so they can fornicate with each other. So, yeah, it, it is satanic. It is a cult. Uh, Hitler had the Olympic Games. They built this giant big stadium and things. So, they're, whenever they have this New World Order collection of all the countries coming together to play sports, they're still, it's like miniature Tower of Babels building these huge, big sports stadiums and towers and things, this flaming torch. Again, there's symbology there of Lucifer. Um, absolutely. So I wouldn't listen to Paul Begley, but yes, the Olympics is a cult. Um, okay, Frank392 says, If we all came from Adam and Eve, same race, from where all the races come from? Uh, you know, I do have a study on that subject. Um, can't think of what the thing is called, but but you know, you can study. You can look at the. I'll see if I can type this in here quick. Okay. Yeah. Does the Bible teach racism? Parts one and two. Um, I talking about where the races come from, but basically it, it comes from after the flood, uh, Genesis chapter 9, there towards the end, verses 24 through 29, and then specifically Genesis chapter 10 and chapter 11 is where you'll read about how the different sons went out and populated and their descendants, how they came down through. So... Um, that's where the different races came from. The word races is not a King James Bible word. Nations, ethnicity, kindred, people, tongue. You know, ethnicity is technically not a Bible word, but, you know, nation. Okay, go down through here. Anthony Agins. Do we have to read the Greek in order to understand what the Bible really says? Thank you. Absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, no. Uh, you don't need to understand Greek to understand what the Bible says. Okay, even if you could read Greek, you're still going to have to translate it into English in order to be able to get to talking to people and things. Uh, so, no, you don't need to read Greek. And you also have the problem of uh, there are many different Greek texts. Uh, again, just explaining it to new Christians here, if you don't understand. Um, there are, you'll find, if you find an ancient Greek manuscript, um, there Usually they fall into two different categories. Um, you'll find them that they usually, usually will line up with Greek uh, received texts, the Textus Receptus they call it in Latin. Um, it's basically just the, the vast majority of Greek manuscripts that go back to the Greek Orthodox people that have come down through the centuries. They faithfully preserve the texts that come from Antioch. And I say faithfully, you'll find times when there might be a word or two in error or something, not in error, but uh, that have, you know, were scribbled out or, or worn out or something like this. A lot of them are very, very old manuscripts and you, you don't have all the words that wear out or something like this. Um, and then you'll find other types of manuscripts that will line up with a critical text known as the Alexandrian manuscripts. It goes back to Egypt, Egyptian type text. That's the vast majority, or minority, excuse me, only 1% less than 1% actually of, of the manuscripts that are in museums and stuff, these ancient manuscripts, will line up with the Alexandrian type. And they have been preserved mostly by the Roman Catholic Church. So uh, to say, do I have to read the Greek? Well, there is no the Greek. Okay, And even if you get a received text, a Textus Receptus, 
Um, there's multiple editions of that. There's different ways to interpret uh, what does this word mean, how is it defined. It just it it's a it's a system um, that is just it's just not worth you studying. Uh, everything that you need is in this King James Bible. You aren't going to find anything in Greek that you can't get from the English. Okay. Denny Hampton. Brother Brian, I believe you mentioned in a past video that new wine is grape juice. In Acts 2, after the Holy Spirit was first given to the apostles, some of the Jews mocked, saying that they were full of new wine, indicating that they were drunk. So how do they get drunk on grape juice? Okay. Um, well, I do believe that new wine... Uh, well, let me give you the scriptures on it, brother. Um... Uh. Okay, Isaiah chapter sixty five, verse eight. Isaiah 65, verse 8. Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servants' sake, uh, sakes, that I, might, that I may destroy them all. Okay? So right there it says, the new wine is found in the cluster, the cluster of grapes. So it's not my interpretation that new wine is grape juice, unfermented grape juice. It's what the Bible says. Okay, it's right there. Uh, you bring up the thing of Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Uh, verse 13. Others mocking said these men are full of new wine. Okay. So you say, well, wouldn't that be alcoholic? Well... Uh, notice that they were mocking them. Now, if these people were Christians, you know, which they were in Acts chapter 2, I, you know, in the sense of the gospel that was there at that time, I do believe that they were saved and in the body of Christ, so they would have been Christians. But, um, you know, the people would have known that they're not going to be drunk. They're not going to be going out and drinking and drunkards and stuff like this. So they were mocking, and they were saying it'd be like, Sounds like they got drunk on on grape juice or something. You know, I don't know how. How can I even say that? Um, they're mocking them, saying, "We know that they wouldn't be drunkards, but maybe they drank so much new wine that they got drunk." You know, and I'm not. You know, I I see. Uh, you know, Sir N. Daniel says here, and I need to. I don't. I'm not saying most of these replies, but I will say this. My experience with this issue is teetotaler, Baptists, and others are bent on making alcohol consumption a sin, and they rest such verses to compel others to the, of their position. Uh, I'm not resting anything, okay, and I'm not a teetotaler Baptist either. You know, you got to get a hold of that one. But um, I understand what the Bible says, prohibitions, prohibitions against drinking of alcoholic beverages. And that's why, you know, um, I'll show you here real quickly what the, what the Bible does say about the thing of wine. Um, trying to think of where the scripture is. Uh, Proverbs chapter 23, uh, verse 31. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his collar in the cup when it moveth itself aright. Okay, it's fermented. Okay, and it's very alcoholic. Um, but then Paul tells Timothy to drink wine for his often infirmities. Uh, fermented wine has some medicinal qualities to it. So, 
I'm not a teetotaler saying you can never drink anything alcoholic, but I understand the sin of drunkenness. It is a sin. Uh, but, you know, what's going on here, you know, I believe you mentioned in a past video that new wine is grape juice. Well, I said that because of Isaiah chapter 65, verse 8. New wine is in the clusters. I don't just base these things on my own feelings, okay? Um, in Acts 2, after the Holy Spirit was first given to the apostles, some of the Jews mocked, saying they were full of new wine, indicating that they were drunk. No, they were mocking. They were not saying, you're drunk. They were mocking them, saying, oh, look at these. They probably got drunk off new wine. Okay? Um, you know, they weren't saying, you're drunk on grape juice. They were mocking them, saying, they're drunk with new wine. Okay, be kind of like me saying, you know, uh, that woman's so righteous, you know, she could probably get, you know, drunk off of water or something like that. You know, it's a way of mocking somebody. You're such a goody two-shoes that you could probably, you know, you're so pure and holy that even something like grape juice would make you drunk or something. It's They're mocking them. They're not saying you are drunk with new wine. They're saying, you know, they have the appearance of being, you know, that they're drunk on new wine. I don't know, I'm getting, that's, <laughs> I'm not making much sense. But the point is, you know, Isaiah 65, verse 8 is where it defines new wine is in the cluster. So, okay. Alfie Ward. Is it okay for KJV believers to read the Apocrypha? Sure, but just don't take it seriously. Um, I wouldn't mess with the Apocrypha as far as it being inspired scripture. You can study it. You can read it. Uh, originally, it would have been between your Old Testament and New Testament in 1611 when the King James Bible first came out. But they put it in there for historical purposes, not because it was inspired scripture. The apocryphal books, if you pick up a Catholic Bible, are interspersed with the Old Testament writings. So I wouldn't. you can read it, but don't take it seriously. Don't think of it as scripture. All right. Probably should take a break here before real long, but uh, I'll read a couple more. Um, let me see something quick here. Okay. Brian Bailey says, Hi, Brian. It's Brian. I like your name. Uh, I have a question about Romans 1.17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. My question is, what does Paul mean when he says faith to faith? Thanks and God bless you, your family, and ministry. Huh. Um, hmm. It's a good question. Romans chapter 1. So this is a good way to learn the Bible for everybody involved, including myself. Um, you know, we're iron sharpening iron, basically, here. You're asking me questions from the Scriptures. I'm giving you answers, and, and then, you know, people will write back and whatever. We're considering these Scriptures together. Uh, Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of Therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Okay? So what's the faith to faith? Well, verse 16 says, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The righteousness, for, it says, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. The Jews had faith first, and then the Gentiles. Okay? But they come together. How do you know? As it is written... The just shall live by faith. Okay, so it's revealed from faith, the Jews, to faith, the Greeks, there. And all of them, as the just, they live by faith. That's how I would interpret that. Okay? Um, I'm going to go a little bit longer here. It's till 5 o'clock. I guess I'll do it till then. Um, Brooks Martin, I am a King James Bible believer, but I also believe the sign gift of miracles and healings are for today. I use it as a tool to evangelize. 
People almost 100% of the time get healed instantly when commanding pain and sickness to go in Jesus' name. So my question is, how am I using demonic power to heal when it gets people, people's attention to preach the gospel? Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Thank you, brother. Keep up the great work. Okay, um, uh, it's a sign gift of miracles and healing are for today. Well, why don't we look at what the scripture says. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Are you preaching to Jews? You say, well, you know, I, I preach to everybody. Okay, uh, why are you preaching to non-Jews? Or why are you giving signs to non-Jews? The Bible doesn't say to do that. I use it as a tool to evangelize. Chapter and verse on that. My question is, how am I using demonic power to heal when it gets people's attention to preach the gospel? And you put 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 in parentheses there. Where does it say anything about healing people in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4? And uh, what do you do with... Uh, 2 Corinthians, we read this earlier if you haven't seen this. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. Um, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Question. Are you better than the Apostle Paul? Do you have some spiritual connection to God that Paul didn't have? How is it that you can heal people you say almost 100% of the time, instantly they're getting healed, according to what you wrote here, uh, Brooks. You're saying that you're healing people almost 100% of the time, yet Paul couldn't get healed. Do you have a connection to the Lord that Paul didn't have? How about the thing of Paul saying that he's, his strength is made perfect in weakness? That's kind of a problem. Um, I'm sorry, but I don't believe in your ministry. I don't believe in that at all. You say it's, it's still for today, miraculous healing and stuff is still for today. Uh, I don't agree with that. You're going to have a hard time pre proving that from the Pauline epistles. All right, there are gifts of healings, or gifts of healing, excuse me, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Sure, that's there, but uh, I don't believe that that's miraculous laying on of hands and the sick recovering. Those things were there given for the Jews. So if you're not ministering to the Jews, the Jews are the ones that required the signs. Okay? Uh, and if you're telling people, I'm going to heal you, and then you can get saved as a result of that, that's false. That's not real. Okay? Uh, people need to come to God as sinners in need of a Savior. Not coming and saying, I just got healed of this sickness that I had. Now I'll get saved. It doesn't work that way. And to tell people that are saved, you can be healed of every disease you've ever been. Well, that's a real problem for Paul then, isn't it? Sorry. I don't believe in what you're doing. Christian O'Balan. According to the Bible, what should be our position regarding the so-called celibate gay Christian movement? <laughs> uh, you know, I think I have a study I did on that. Let me just see here quick. You know, any anytime you want to you know, ask something or whatever else, just type in a keyword there. Um, oh, no, I, don't, I know what it was. It wasn't that celibate. It was a eunuch. Um, FAQ number 40, are eunuchs sodomites? Uh, and no, they're not. But uh, let me show you a problem with that whole thing here. Celibate Christian gay, what was it the, let me get that again. The celibate gay Christian movement. Uh, there is no such thing as a gay Christian. Okay, unless that means you're happy. There are happy Christians. But uh, sodomite Christians, there is no such thing. Um, but what about celibacy? First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. 
Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Look at this, verse 3. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Forbidding to marry is a doctrine of devils. And to say gay Christian celibate movement, that's like kind of saying a... Um, a uh, peaceful Muslim or something, you know. Yeah, right, there's no such thing. Uh, or uh, perhaps a non-criminal murderer or something. There are no gay Christians, okay. Uh, sodomy, as the Bible calls it, is an abomination in God's sight. Uh, there is no such thing as somebody that can be saved continuing that lifestyle and just say, well, I'm celibate, I'm just a sodomite celibate. No, 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 no. It's an abomination in God's sight. So, uh, and I've done whole studies on this thing of sodomy and stuff like that, okay? So I'm going to do one more here, and then I'm going to quit for now. Kingdom Cab, Romans 7, 14 through 25, is properly interpreted by many of us saved Christians as Paul, as Paul speaking in present tense, like a screenplay of his past unregenerate life, before salvation, under conviction of the Holy Ghost. Is not this a good passage that a persistent, unrepentant sin committer, a sinner, can use to defend sin and attack holiness? Saved Christians ought to defend holiness and attack sin. Context plus context equals meaning. Oh boy. What I'm seeing here with you there is uh, another one of these uh, Levi Price uh, wing nut types that uh, come out and say, once you're saved, you're not going to be sinning. You're not going to be continuing in sin, and you won't struggle with it. And if you struggle, then you weren't really saved or something like this. You're going to struggle with sin, okay? Paul is not speaking in past tense here, okay? I mean, just, just read it, all right? Let's, let's read the, the scripture that you said here, Romans 7, 14 through 25. But for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that do I. How's that past tense? He's talking present tense. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Christ Jesus our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. He's speaking present tense. But there's an even better scripture to nail you on this whole holiness. You know, I had the, the old man eradicated, the second work of grace, and whatever, this old Nazarene type of stupidity where people say, you know, I just don't sin anymore, brother. I just don't sin. Well, I could prove that wrong very, very quickly. We start getting into the thing of pride and covetousness and gluttony and, uh, you know, slothfulness and whatever else. Oh, we could prove that you live in sin all the time. And Paul is not writing in Romans 7 saying, yeah, I was fornicating the other night and I got drunk the other night and I was stoned the other day and stuff like that. That's not what he's talking about. But as a Christian, you're, you're going to see that struggle with sin. And we live much cleaner lives than most lost people, but we still struggle with sin. All right. But here's a real good one. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. You better be careful about this holiness thing and saying, you know, oh, uh, Saved Christians ought to defend holiness and attack sin. Well, sure, absolutely. But don't go around saying that you're somehow 
uh, sinlessly perfect and the old, the old man's been eradicated and you don't sin anymore and you do these weird things and, and you know, whatever. A lot of those people are trying to merit their own salvation. They're trying to somehow clean up their own lives. They're self-righteous, you know. Be very careful about that. So that's going to be it for right now. I'm going to uh, come back and uh, finish up these other comments, Lord willing. So that is going to be it. Thank you for watching.